So there's some stuff that I just have to assume, but every good book has it on condensed matter theory, etc. So, so we, uh, I assume you will learn it by yourself. So the out of curiosity, all these graduate students, how many have been ever uh, taught the character orthogonality or completeness in any condensed matter, atomic physics, or any other course? Just raise your hand. Okay, however, zero hands, right? However, uh, my colleagues don't allow me to teach group theory, so go talk to the <laughs> graduate uh, curriculum committee and don't bug me. Character. To do this requires character. And uh, what are characters? It's really just generalization of Fourier of this I, you know, K. X that you always see in Fourier analysis. It's a generalization for groups other than uh, translations or SO2 group. And that's how it was invented. And the result of this, now 120 years old at least, is a character is defined as a trace of a matrix where this labels irreducible representations in Fourier analysis this is the label of the all one dimensional and this is the label of each one uh, this is the abstract group element. There is a representation. So there is a D alpha cross D alpha matrix. which tells you how, uh, how this acts on x in the subspace alpha, is reducible subspace. So these are coordinates. And dimension is delta alpha. Every group has an identity element, so that's a matrix with ones on it. And the uh, trace of it identity matrix is obviously the, the dimension of the matrix and therefore the subspace. So now the big deal is character orthogonality. You know, this is a cantata in two pieces. One is first you learn how to sing what I learned in 1890s, Frobenius, Schur, and other amazing German mathematicians. And uh, that's done for finite groups. In condensed matter, these are called point groups. So these are things where you take a crystal and you can turn it and map it into itself. For example, hexagonal or cubic lattice, etc. And um, the formula is Uh, 
So these are either same or different representations, in general different irreducible representations of the action of the group. And this is an average, group average. In the second version of the same song, more romantic version one, uh, this gets replaced by the, an integral over the parameters group space. It's a Kohlhaar integral, but which is normalized to one, and this obviously is normalized to one because if I average over a constant, then I'm just counting the number of elements, dividing it by the number of elements of a finite group. And this has the property that if I'm in the same representation, you know, morally, if I'm looking at the square of something, then under the action of the group, I get unity when I average the square. And then there is the alpha. I write it in a slightly more general form than the first time one learns this. <coughs> Where these are any D alpha times D alpha matrices. Not necessarily group elements. And this is useful because, you know, if you find it very weird that we're looking only at the numbers, and uh, but we're acting on d-dimensional spaces, etc., you can go to the usual orthogonality of uh, representations, irreducible representations, by taking derivatives with respect to these guys. So nothing is lost by looking at characters. The idea of the character is that <clears throat> we know that, for example, in the problem where we have a reflection over three axes, they're morally equivalent. And that's obtained by uh, applying similarity transformations. And similarity transformation generates something called the class, all things which are morally the same. Uh, the character being a trace will be independent of which element in this group in the class I take, because you know, I would have a similarity minus one times similarity, but in a trace, by cyclic property, a trace that cancels. So this is picking out the invariant information about qualitatively different group operations. So that's why you want to use characters. And uh, if you take, you know, here I have two special cases that make sense. So if H and F is just identity matrix. And this is a trace of identity, so this becomes one, because it's divided by identity. And you get the usual version of this average over all group operations, normalized average. And uh, alpha, theta, two representations, G, minus one. This thing has gone away and this is just alpha and that's called you know orthogonality. And 
and you think of this object here, see I'm summing of on uh, discrete set of indices. So you think of this as a vector labeled by G. So this is a G dimensional vector. And this statement says that you can span the G dimensional vector space by a set of orthogonal vectors and characters are those orthogonal vectors. I mean here it's ex explicit. And the way I will use it in derivation of place formula is I'll set one of these guys equal to identity. In that case, the average over character of group element and the shifted character of the group element. So you can see that this orthogonality relations enable you to compute averages over characters in terms of averages of other characters and that will find useful, that will actually use explicitly in derivation of trace formula. So that says characters are orth orthogonal. And the other property that we need, we are spanning some vector space, so we need completeness. And in that case, What we have is, if we sum over irreducible representations, we find that If the group elements are different, then this average over irreducible representation is zero. And if it's the same representation, then it acts like a square. And, uh, and in this case, you know, we think of this as number of irreducible representation. dimensional vector. And we will use this in the usual trickery of how we uh, go from original space to the reduced space these things are called spectral decomposition in other cases but basically you replace the identity with the sum, completeness sum, and then you use uh, some other sum that, that you had that were awkward, now become simple. You evaluate those sums and you get the final result, which says that interesting stuff is all in the space of irreducible representations.
So here is the simple example. We take the hydro group with two elements. So that's identity and let's say reflection. And we think of it very literally, like in condensed matter. So the a realization of it is on one dimensional line. So we take x to be as simple as possible. It could be you know, in many dimensions, but here is the simplest case. One. <coughs> then operation R acting on x returns minus x. Obviously R squared is the identity. And for that reason, in that special case, rather unusual, the operation is its own inverse. Usually we have to pay attention about inverses. But uh, in the simple case, we don't. So then the characters are very simple. Here is the character table for dihedral group 1. There are only two elements, E and reflection. And there are only two characters. One has to do with symmetrization, and the other one has to do with anti-symmetrization. In uh, crystallography, conventional call A1 and A2. Now, identity. Uh, has the same character, it's identity in all irreducible representations, so it's, it's uh, has character one, but the anti-symmetrization, uh, the reflection has character two. So now we can check orthonormality, orthogonality. So this, this sum here has two elements, group is two elements. And the first element is uh, chi alpha of identity. Because I'm summing over the group element alpha identity uh, plus chi alpha of the reflection alpha of the reflection and uh, they should be different in general. And clearly, if alpha equals beta, this is a square, and it's a square of either 1 or minus 1. So I check this part. The so only thing I need to check is if they're different. So if this is chi of A1, E chi of A2, E plus same for reflections, which is one half of one times one tuk -tuk, plus one for the symmetric guy times minus one for the anti-symmetric guy, and that's zero, and so on. So that's how the character tables work out. Uh, in more general case. And the completeness, we also need completeness. In that case, we have a sum of a number of group elements. And now, 
be sum over the representations that can have different elements. And um, again, if g equals h, these are two squares, and everybody's one, so that works out. And if one of them is identity, another one is reflection, then I get a minus sign from here, and I also have orthonormality. So I get delta of delta of g h. And remember for discrete groups, you know, these are just integers. You can think of them as integers. So that's the first piece you need to understand. And the beautiful thing is that this problem has been solved. So we know that character formulas apply to all finite groups. And amazingly still, we also know that they apply to all in an almost identical way to all continuous groups which are compact. Things like rotations, unitary groups, etc. With uh, non-preserved length, non-Minkowski metric, for example. Now the theory also works for other situations. For example, translations are not compact, but we know how to do them in condensed matter theory. That's called uh, Bravais lattices, Brillouin zones, etc. So there is, you know, a simple part of it, and then there is a fairly well-developed part because one needs to use it all the time. And let's say graphene physics is the current example. Now, both in quantum mechanics and in ergodic theory, we are interested in what symmetry operations do to functions. In quantum mechanics, they call wave functions, and in uh, ergodic theory, they call density functions. So we have linear operators and they act on functions, and now we like to know what the symmetries do. And that requires a little bit of thinking, which was done by Wigner in the 30s. So we would like to know What do we mean by a symmetry operation acting on function phi of x, where function is just returning real values in our case, and x is a state space point uh, which is in some finite dimensional state space, or dimension d. So we would like to know how. What do we mean by it? So Bigness says, so I will denote this combination G phi is an operation, so this is an operator. <coughs> so this is some operation that takes a function and returns some other function. 
and we want to define what that operation is. And Wigner says, well, if we evaluate it, a transform point, and that we know what it is. So this is d by d matrix. Representation of uh, you know, elements of group G. So the whole object, it's a function evaluated at transform point. Wigner says uh, it should have the same value. as original function, g evaluated at x. So he says, the way I'll define this operation, and again, it's not so mysterious because you have done it often without all this notation. I want this to be its value is what it was in the coordinates before I applied the transformation. Uh, or we can write this at g of acting on a function at x is same as value of the function at the different coordinate obtained by transformation. So now, you know, everybody writes this differently. Uh, people introduced weird letters, so you know, maybe they call this operator labeled by G or, or whatever notation. So unfortunately, every book and every subject will have different notation. I'm trying to be most economical. G inverse? G inverse, of course. Thanks. Totally crucial. So this is simply a definition of what we mean acting on a function. So this is operation, operation. And this is a matrix. And as we know what this is, we know what the value of that function is. So now I'll combine the two pieces and uh, yeah, postulate that there are projection operators which map functions into irreducible subspaces where only irreducible representations work. And I'll just write the guess and then we'll check that it's correct. So here is the definition. P <coughs> labeled by reducible representation, it's an operation, just like this is an operation. It's something that we'll do to a function. It's an average over the group. of a character alpha of the group operation and then operation minus one. So this is not operation, operator. That means that if I apply this operation to a function 
and X. And then there was a thing that, that this turns out to be important, so it's correctly normalized. I will check normalization. So the dimension of the alpha representation. Then everything will be like on the dotted line. But here we'll have phi of g of x. So when we are acting, <coughs> but to do formal manipulations, we don't need to write this uh, function explicitly. But, but, but it, what we mean by it is this matrix. So it is. It is orthogonal. That's a little calculation. So let's see what if we first act, project on representation B, and then we project on representation alpha. You know, what does that do? That is, by definition, double sum. Over G. And H. <coughs> so we have X of of G H. And then if you look how this works, it's gonna work out like this. And now, if you remember, we had this thing here. I guess you don't have to remember. It tells you that we can do one of the sums and replace it by a single character. And to do that sum, what we notice is that we can introduce a new thing. So we can call this combination. Let's call h minus 1. E minus, well, let me write this way. Let me write H as G minus 1 times another group operation minus 1. You know, I, I can always do that because the group algebra is unique F. And now we have a sum over, oh, let me just say this, sum over g, 1 over g, g. So I'll do this sum. It says x alpha g, g minus 1 f minus 1. And this, by definition, is uh, f, I guess. I think I would like it to be f minus 1. So is, th is this f minus 1? <laughs> what is it? We need f on um, instead of f. Inverse. Right here? I think so. Okay. That would also inside of the psi beta. 
Yeah. I don't like it, but let me just put minus one and just see what happens. Anyway. I had it correctly earlier, so it'll be fixable even if I screw up. So now, uh, according to this rule, so the sum I get uh, delta alpha beta. So I'll get normality of the projectors because Kronecker delta shows up explicitly. And then this rule here says that that's same as 1 over d alpha. This guy here, and then chi of f minus 1. And now this sum can be written as a sum of f because uh, sum of uh, yeah. f is uh, okay. All right. Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm slow, so I have to do this slow. H, so F is H minus 1, T minus 1. So this sum over the G is the sum over the all elements, so we can just replace it by letter F. Because every average, no matter what this index, it will produce complete average. So now we have uh, Delta alpha, g from here, sum of the f's, and uh, there was a delta beta, you know, this guy cancels. So we get delta alpha beta p alpha. And again, I'm free to make, I'm summing over all of them, so I can replace this by inverse. And uh, I get the projection operator back. So this projection operator is orthogonal. And they're orthonormal, they're correctly normalized, because if I square them, I get projection operator back. Then I'll leave it to you to check completeness. So you have to check that if I resolve the space into all the reducible representation, uh, you know, that's an identity. So that's just number one, or whatever you decide to call uh, operation that uh, doesn't do anything. And now the tricks that we will use in deriving trace formula defined only on fundamental domain is that occasionally we will insert one and show that uh, one can be written as a sum of irreducible representations. So let's see an example. So the one example is projection operator of the symmetric representation, let's say, of A1 
with this definition is the multiplicity of dimension it happens to be one dimensional representation, so this is one. The group has two elements. And the first element says I'm supposed to take identity and it's inverse, but I just identity. Identity operation plus chi A1 of the reflection operation. And I want to act on a function phi of x. So act on a function phi of x. And by the way, uh, there is the inverse happens to be the operation itself. Acting x. That is one half of one. So just the function itself, nothing happens. Plus, this operation flips the axis, the x-axis. Uh, this character is 1, so this is phi or minus x. So this projection operator, first one, takes a symmetric average of the function. So symmetrize the function around the origin. And uh, A2 will have a minus sign here because the character will change. So it says any function can be written as sum of symmetric and antisymmetric. So this fancy theory of projection operators generalizes this to all discrete groups and all compact continuous groups and tells you for every group how to do all possible symmetrization and antisymmetrization. So, so far this has been just group theory, abstract group theory. Most of it can be done without any reference to particular realization. The character is the intrinsic property of a finite group and uh, you know, they can be realized in many ways in many different settings. So for example, yeah, this group we use in examples on the line, but when we do fluid dynamics or when we do kuramoto shivashinsky equation, then the space is infinite dimensional. Yeah. So the action is on, let's say, Fourier modes, and reflection might be a complex conjugation that changes half of the Fourier modes to negative Fourier modes. So it can be a huge operation. But because it's a Fourier theory, all representations are one-dimensional. It's very easy to implement. But the structure is independent of our particular physical problem. It is so a fairly fun fleck called this the wonderful orthogonality theorem, or wonderful character orthogonality theorem. And it is very pretty because it's kind of group theory that's fun to do. The group theory can get very hard, but this stuff is easy and really cute. So now we want to apply to our particular physical problem. And what a finite group does is partitions the space. I've drawn picture a number of times, but it says instead of looking at the whole space, like for this floor, I can take just one tile and I can describe the operation that I need to do to get to this tile. So I can just have one tile and discrete set of operations, in this case, all translations in two dimensions. But in three disk problem, it was all ways of cutting the pizza in six pieces. So that means that 
when we do any of the things that we're interested in, which is computing average properties of dynamical systems. We have some function and we integrated our whole space. Discrete symmetry says that I can write this as number of tiles, I'm assuming group is compact in this case. If it's non-compact, we'll need to take some more Fourier transforms and stuff like that. That's called space groups when they're not compact. And then I will average over the group, group element. Remember, in continuous case, this is going to be a hard measure. But all it means is it's a uniform average over all possible actions of the group. And uh, the function gets evaluated if I define x where I'm now to be my fundamental corresponding x in the fundamental tile times the group operation that puts me here. And if I use obvious, but you can show it for a final group, the determinant of G1 is always 1, because it doesn't deform, it just moves stuff around. Then this becomes phi of inverse of the group operation acting on x. Because, you know, I've changed this coordinates, I've used this Jacobian, and g minus came from uh, God knows where. Because you know, if that tile was there, I had to bring it back. So that's the g minus. And you know, if you don't like it, you can make it plus because we're averaging all elements anyhow. So the inverses do the same job. So, so this is now the total volume state space. Yeah, it's been. It's a volume of a towel times the number of the towels. And this is an average. So you can think of it as a, as a, Averaged over the group. You know, it's 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 the value. You know, I had some mountainous landscape. On every tile, the height will be different, and this is taking all the heights and averaging them, computing an average. One question: yeah? the element in the differential element does it still appear? Uh, I use the. You know, I used that dx is a determinant, the Jacobian of that g dx prime. So it's there, but uh, for compact groups, I can always, you know, for finite groups, it's kind of obvious, but also for continuous groups, I can make it unity. So, you know, all compact groups can be represented by unitary transformations, which have magnitude one, or you know, determinant one. Okay, so that means that I can always reduce dynamics if I have a finite group in this case, I can always go to the fundamental domain if the group was continuous, I would always go to the base manifold of the slice or something. So this would be. 
and uh, and then average whatever I'm interested in as a group average computed on this domain. So at this point I've not, not used any invariance, equivariance or anything. It's just the fact that whenever you have a tiling you can write the space as one tile plus all the group operations on the tile. So there is no equivariance in this. So now I would like to use this to and apply to evaluation of a trace. I, I could discuss just evolution opera by itself without looking at the trace. Uh, but, you know, this is simpler. We're only interested in variant information, and that thing would involve lots of matrices uh, on the partition or the regular representation of the group. If I look at traces, I can uh, do everything in terms of also traces of the group, which is the characters. So, I would like to compute the trace of our evolution operator. You know, I'll assume time is equal one, you can always insert time later, and I will assume uh, that we're only looking at the Perron Frobenius operator that just moves the measures, but you can always generalize this for computing uh, evolution of observables, which are weighted by observables. And what's a trace? I take my two-dimensional matrix, but because there's a continuous indices, you know, this is an operator. And then I identify first and the last index delta. And then I integrate over both so that's the definition of a trace. According to our rule, we can write this as the number of tiles squared, because we're doing two integrations, and do integration only on the tile. So it's the same volume in a state space, but variables are different. And we'll define x equals a or x tilde y plus b or y tilde and uh, a, b, c, etc. will be elements of our finite group. And for any finite group determinant of g absolute values one. That's what we'll use. So now we write this as an average of a continuous index and our group index, which is a this is a discrete sum, and the average of the other guy. And 
now we have uh, x tilde minus lambda. So far we haven't assumed anything about symmetry other than the space itself can be powered using the symmetry. Now what does equivalent say? says that <coughs> when I look at my evolution of y x being uh, like delta y minus f of x and if I go to the fundamental domain by using group operation. Equivalent says that this can be moved through so I can either uh, move the initial point or the final point by equivalence is the same. But I can now write this as a matrix B acting on Y prime. Matrix B acting on Y prime minus E minus 1A of X prime. And the delta function, if I change the coordinates, I'll pick up one of the determinant of this transformation. But that's one, so this is the same as y prime minus b minus one a f of x prime. And now we're in the same situation we were before. Turns out there's actually only one group operation that's left. We're summing over two variables, but we only care about the relative uh, distance between. If I start in fundamental domain and land someplace, and what it takes to come back to fundamental domain, that's the meaning of this group factor. So I can again <coughs> write our sum and you know, the same logic goes here, here it's trivial right? because there is no function. So both Kronecker delta, I mean Dirac delta and the operator itself only depend on. So this is the same as looking at y tilde c of uh, x tilde where c is b minus 1a. And now I have these two sums, so I can get rid of one of them. You know, one of them I can call sum over the c, and then the other one is independent. Uh, you know, nothing depends on the other thing, just as I did before. So I can write this as dx tilde du i tilde fundamental domain, fundamental domain
over this guy called C. The belt uh, on the, it only depends on C. <coughs> so this average is to one. And I have starting, ending, point. Um, and actually, you know, at this point, I can do the trace integral, get rid of this guy anyhow. So we get that this is the sum over C you start to the X maybe I'll just write this the like delta function it's easier <coughs> and then there is a transformation C and you sum over all of those so now, <coughs> we realize this is a definition of a relative periodic orbit because for relative periodic orbit, I go some time and I find myself <coughs> on the group orbit of the initial point. So, uh, maybe X <coughs> TP times the element C, you know, group element P. So this thing will have contributions, which we didn't see before, because in the original sum, we were only getting contributions from periodic orbits. On fundamental domain, we have an average over C, and it picks up something whenever we have a relative periodic orbit. So at this point, I'll stop because who is presenting? You're presenting. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you can see you will insert the completeness relation in here one and show that this is a sum of uh, irreducible representations. But I'll do it next time. Or maybe I'll do it in a homemade video. Go ahead. This soprano comes to a small Italian town and uh, she sings an aria in the local opera house and she sings it and when she's done she's not very happy with how she did it but audience goes crazy they clap, they clap, they clap so she sings it again. And the audience again, clap, clap, clap. Ancora, ancora, una volta, ancora. She does it again, <coughs> three times. They want it again. So how many times do I have to do it? You have to do it until you get it right. <coughs> and so I apologize to this class. I should have gotten it right first time, but I haven't. So, and you anyhow are thinking about your projects, so you can just think of this as entertainment. But, uh, you know, I have to do derivation of symmetry reduction of trace formulas right. It just has to be done. So I'll try, I'll sing it one more time and try to clean up the poop from the previous, previous experiences. <laughs> 